24-year-old Scott Burgess and 19-year-old Laura Milne had never met each other and lived in completely different parts of Scotland, but the fates of both would be decided by a knock on a door. Hi wee ones, it's just me Dawn today. So before I start this week's episode, I need to give you a trigger warning, as both of the cases discussed today are particularly horrific and graphic, so please be warned. Scott Burgess was 24 years old and grew up with his mum, dad and seven brothers and sisters. He then moved to Paisley, which is about 12 miles or 19 kilometres east of Glasgow, where he lived in a flat that was right next door to sisters Karen and Irene Duncan. Sadly, not much else is known about Scott, other than he kept in regular contact with his family. Upon moving into the flat in Paisley, Scott just went about his life quite happily, until sometime between the 23rd of August 2007 and the 6th of September 2007, when out of the blue, the Duncan sisters, Karen and Irene, and Karen's boyfriend, Stephen Price, came knocking at the door of Scott's flat. Laura Milne was 19 years old and was brought up in the town of Ellen in Aberdeenshire, about 16 miles or 25 kilometres north of Aberdeen, which is located in the northeast of Scotland. She lived there with her dad, Brian, and her older brother and younger sister. Laura was diagnosed with mild learning difficulties and was described as being vulnerable, naive and easily manipulated, but that she had a huge heart and just wanted to help others. Sadly, Laura's school years were marred as she was constantly bullied throughout this time by fellow pupil Debbie Buchan. However, despite the relentless bullying, upon leaving school, Laura's disposition hadn't changed and she still just wanted to help others which led to her finding work at a homeless charity in Aberdeen, where she was given a room to stay in and she worked in the kitchen, and she enjoyed this immensely. Laura was very close to her family and kept in constant contact with them, phoning and visiting them often. Laura continued to enjoy living and working at the homeless charity, even making friends with some of the homeless people there, including 18-year-old Lee McKinnon and 22-year-old Stuart Jack. However, Laura's school bully, 19-year-old Debbie Buchan, then appeared at the homeless charity. Despite Debbie's bullying of Laura throughout her school life, Laura held no grudge and was quick to welcome Debbie into the homeless charity and her group of friends. Upon hearing about the reappearance of Debbie in Laura's life, Laura's dad, Brian, warned her not to trust Debbie, but Laura was adamant that things had changed, that the bullying was in the past and that Debbie was now her friend. Laura, Stuart, Lee and Debbie continued to spend quite a bit of time together and on the 12th of December 2007, Debbie invited Laura to come to her flat after she'd finished working in the kitchen, joining Lee and Stuart there too. Laura would have been thoroughly looking forward to spending yet more time with her friends and so upon finishing up in the kitchen, Laura made her way to Debbie's flat and knocked on the door. Scott Burgess was watching the TV in his flat having a few quiet drinks, but upon hearing the knock on his flat door, he got up to answer it. As he began to open the door, he was thrown backwards as three people barged into his flat. The uninvited visitors were his next-door neighbours, Karen Duncan, who was 16, Karen's sister Irene, who was 18 years old, and Karen's boyfriend, 19-year-old Stephen Price. Scott would have quickly realised that the trio had been drinking heavily and that this probably meant trouble. Just as this thought would have passed through Scott's mind, Stephen Price headbutted Scott and then proceeded to repeatedly plunge a knife into Scott's body. Scott was stabbed at least 80 times in his back, his front and in his temple, with Karen also stabbing Scott twice with a screwdriver. This was an absolutely brutal, unprovoked attack, but what happened after the attack was even more gruesome. Laura Milne's knock on the flat door was answered almost immediately by Debbie, who invited her in to join Lee and Stuart inside. It would have been clear to Laura that Stuart and Lee had been drinking heavily, but despite this, Laura would have been pleased to see her friends. However, having come straight from work, she would have first wanted to freshen up in the toilet before having a drink and joining her friends for the evening. Laura had only just stepped into the toilet and locked the door when suddenly the door was kicked open and she was dragged out and thrown to the floor. What followed was a brutal, unprovoked attack on the defenceless Laura. Laura was punched and kicked repeatedly on her head and body by Debbie, Lee and Stuart, with Lee later saying that she thought she'd broken her toe, she'd belted something so hard. 
Debbie also repeatedly stamped on Laura's head with her feet, while Lee also hit Laura with a bottle several times. While Laura lay unconscious, bleeding and severely beaten on the floor, Stuart retrieved a knife from the kitchen and cut Laura's throat, killing her. It was reported in the post-mortem later that Laura had extensive bruising to her face and body, that one rib was cracked, her incisor teeth were loosened in their sockets, her jaw was fractured in three places and she had head injuries. It was possible that Laura would have sustained brain damage due to the severity of the beating had she survived. While this attack was absolutely disgusting, what happened next is equally as shocking. Scott Burgess was stabbed over 80 times, but what possible reason could there be for Stephen Price and Karen and Irene Duncan to barge into Scott's flat and attack him so brutally? Well, apparently it was all because Stephen Price had got it into his head that Scott had said something derogatory about his friends. That, and the fact that they had all been drinking heavily, might also have played a small part. So let's go back to the day of the attack, because as horrendous as that was, there was much worse to come. So it's not known the exact day that Scott was attacked. I guess the trio were that out of it that they'd just forgotten. But it apparently happened between the 23rd of August 2007 and the 6th of September 2007. Stephen Price and the Duncan sisters had been in their flat, next door to Scott's flat, getting drunk. And the conversation about Scott apparently having said something derogatory about Stephen Price's friends came up. So the trio sat there hatching a plan of revenge before making their way to Scott's flat knocking on the door and barging their way in, with Stephen Price starting to attack Scott straight away. This attack was so vicious that Price actually stabbed himself in the arm. Scott would have quickly slipped into unconsciousness before dying. Now, you'd think after carrying that out, you'd maybe be in shock. I don't know, thinking, shit, what have I done? Maybe? Yes? However, not these three. Stephen Price then proceeded to pose next to Scott's dead body, brandishing the actual knife he'd just killed Scott with and smiling, while the sisters took the photos on a mobile phone. But it gets even worse. After taking the photos, the Duncan sisters and Stephen Price then went back to the sisters' flat, where Karen and Stephen got into the bath fully clothed, and Irene Duncan took photos showing Stephen wielding the murder weapon again, while he and Karen splashed about in the bath which was red with Scott's blood, all while laughing. The photos also showed that Scott's blood was all over Stephen. His face and his hands were covered, and it was even in his hair. The trio then carried on with their day as if nothing happened, drinking and laughing, while Scott's lifeless body lay just through the wall from them. The next day, however, after sobering up, there was another chance to, you know, come clean, face up to what had been done and do the right thing. But no. Instead, the Duncan sisters went back into Scott's flat, carried his body to the bathroom, dumped it face down in the bath, then filled it with water and bleach. They then proceeded to cut out parts of the carpet that had been soaked in blood and put it in the rubbish bin, where they attempted to burn it. They then gathered their blood-stained clothes they had all been wearing, the knife, the screwdriver, the mobile phone, after attempting to destroy it, and placed everything together in a black bag and buried it. So while the sisters were doing everything they could to cover up that they had committed a truly barbaric crime, Stephen, on the other hand, was busy mouthing off to his dad, James. In an article in the Daily Record newspaper on the 26th of March 2008, James advised that Stephen had said, I done a guy in. I stabbed him about 60 times. And I stabbed myself as well. His dad thought that he was just making it up as he'd been known to make things up in the past. Maybe not lies quite as extreme as he'd killed someone, but he was known to make things up. Scott's family, however, were becoming concerned as they'd not been able to make contact with him. And so after nine days of nobody hearing from Scott, his dad and brother, Christopher, who was 18, went to his flat to see if he was there. When they looked through the kitchen window, they saw blood and kicked the door in, before making the truly horrific discovery of Scott's body in the bath, face down. The police were called and started a murder investigation. The details of the murder were soon released and an appeal was made, an appeal which James Price also saw and immediately became suspicious. He said that a week had passed and he had honestly thought that his son was just lying. But on hearing the details and the appeal, he immediately called the police and told them what his son had said. He was utterly disgusted by what he had heard and he wasn't having Scott's murderer get away with it. 
whether it was a son of his or not. He said in a newspaper article, he's just a monster. I can't bear to think what he put that boy through. I know myself that he's a scary boy, especially when he's full of the drugs. He went on to say that the next time he heard from his son, it was via a text and it read, you're dead. Stephen Price was quickly arrested. He denied the allegation, of course. However, that was quickly about to change. Through diligent police work, the buried bag was found with the blood-soaked clothes, the knife, the screwdriver, and of course the broken mobile phone. However, the Duncan sisters hadn't done a very good job of destroying the phone and the gruesome photos were retrieved from it. After the photos were found, a police source reported in a newspaper article, I've never seen such graphic pictures of a murder. Upon Stephen Price being told that they had retrieved the bag and all the pictures that had been taken, he changed his story and admitted he had murdered Scott Burgess. When the Duncan sisters were brought in for questioning, they admitted their part in the murder and were both charged with murder. However, the charge of murder against the two sisters was reduced and instead Karen Duncan was charged with a culpable homicide and both sisters were charged with attempting to defeat the ends of justice by hiding or trying to destroy evidence. Stephen Price and Karen and Irene Duncan pled guilty to their charges. Laura Millen was now lying dead on the floor of Debbie Buckins flat, having been savagely beaten and having her throat cut. But Debbie, Stuart and Lee were not finished yet. In the days that followed, Stuart would cut off one of Laura's ears and breast before practically detaching her legs from her body and almost decapitating her. Stuart, Debbie and Lee then wrapped Laura's head, torso and limbs in bedding and put them under the kitchen sink where Laura's body would stay for a week while the trio came and went from the flat as normal. As Laura was close to her family and contacted them regularly, they would become suspicious if Laura didn't contact them. And so Debbie Buchan replied to six text messages that Laura had received from family members pretending to be Laura, saying that she was fine and staying with friends, but that they would see her soon. This would have added to the family's torment when they eventually found out that Laura was already dead at the time of these text messages being sent to them. And even that is not the most disgusting thing to happen in this case. On the 14th of December, two days after Laura was brutally beaten and murdered, a video clip was recorded of Debbie Buchan and Stuart Jack, who both seemed to be disgustingly rejoicing that Laura was dead, with Debbie saying, I feel so happy that she's gone. She's on my kitchen floor with a slit throat, a cut mouth, cut tit and her head kicked in. When Debbie asked Stuart if he was glad Laura was dead, he smiled and said, yes, I am. And when asked if he enjoyed cutting her throat, he replied, aye. To which Debbie replied, good, I really enjoyed stomping her head to fuck. There's blood all over my walls. Another video clip recorded a few minutes later showed Stuart dancing with Debbie encouraging him. However, the trio were not exactly masterminds and each was desperate to tell their horrific secret. Debbie told an ex-boyfriend that she had been fighting with a female and that she was now lying there looking funny. Lee told one of her friends that she had been at the flat when a girl had been killed. But it was Stuart who put the final nail in the coffin. He told two female residents who were also living at the homeless hostel with him that Laura had said that she was glad his granddad and sister were dead and so he killed her with a bread knife. He went on to say that Debbie and Lee had been the ones who had beaten Laura. Then he had got a knife from the kitchen and cut her throat. Naturally, the two residents were probably dubious about what Stuart was saying and so he led them to Debbie's flat, opened the letterbox and said, Can you smell her body? She's lying in there. No doubt now believing what Stuart was saying, and also probably frightened, the two residents called the police, who found Laura's decomposing body wrapped in bedding in a cupboard under the sink. Debbie and Stuart were arrested on the 20th of December 2007, and Lee McKinnon on the 21st of December 2007 in Glasgow, where she had fled after the attack and murder of Laura. Stuart Jack admitted murdering Laura and attempting to defeat the ends of justice and Debbie Buchan and Lee McKinnon admitted attempted murder and attempting to defeat the ends of justice, and they were charged with the same. The Scott Burgess court case took place in January 2008 at the High Court in Glasgow. Scott Burgess's family were also present for all of the evidence to be presented to the judge in order for them to decide on the sentences 
of Stephen Price and Karen and Irene Duncan after the three pled guilty to their charges. The family had to sit through the horrendous sequence of events, hearing exactly what had been done to Scott's body and of the horrific photos that had been taken. Following the evidence being heard, sentencing was deferred so the judge could take stock of all the evidence that had been presented, as well as asking for background reports on Stephen, Karen and Irene so he could decide on the appropriate sentence for them. So I'll give you a wee bit of background information about the three. The ringleader of the attack was Stephen Price. He had been brought up by his dad James and his stepmom Helen when Helen had married James when Stephen was still a wee boy. Over the years, Stephen was constantly in trouble with the police and was drinking heavily, having got in with the wrong crowd. And so in 2004, when he left school at 16 with no qualifications and no prospect of changing his behaviour, it was thought it best he move out of his parents' home. Helen's mum, Betty, had also played a part in Stephen's life, and so she agreed Stephen could move in with her at this time, thinking she could put him back on the straight and narrow by providing him with stability and encouragement. How wrong she was. Shortly after he moved in with his gran, he was caught shoplifting and assaulted a member of staff. Then a few months later, he assaulted a passenger on a bus. However, his gran would also get a taste of his nasty medicine when she had to call the police as he had threatened to stab her and had become abusive towards her. After each incident, he would always promise to do better and mend his ways, but this never happened. His gran wasn't going to give up on him, though. Anyway, it wasn't long before Stephen slipped back to his old ways again, living between his gran's house and homeless accommodation for a couple of years. And then he met Karen Duncan. Not much is known about Karen Duncan, or indeed her sister Irene, other than they grew up in care, and according to an article in the Daily Record newspaper on the 6th of January 2007, Karen suffered a traumatic event at a young age. Following the judge in the Scott Burgess case receiving the requested background information, it was back to the High Court in Glasgow two months later, on the 25th of March 2008, for Judge Lord Brodie to pass sentence. Lord Brodie sentenced Stephen Price to a life sentence, to spend 15 years in prison before being considered for parole. Lord Brodie said, This was a frenzied and sustained attack. It was an unprovoked attack on an unarmed man in his own home, showing a gross level of depravity. He went on to say that had Stephen Price not pled guilty, he would have given him 20 years. Karen Duncan, now 17, was given a jail sentence of seven years for culpable homicide and was to be supervised for a further three years after her release. And her sister, Irene Duncan, now 18, was sentenced to 27 months in a young offenders institute for attempting to defeat the ends of justice and was to be monitored for a year after her release. After the sentencing, Scott's mum, Anne, spoke out saying she was furious and shocked with the sentences, that they were far too lenient after what the trio had done to her son. She couldn't understand why the sister's murder charge had been reduced feeling that they should instead have been charged with conspiracy to murder, which carries a life sentence. Her feelings were that her son had not got justice. Scott's mum also said in an interview in the Express newspaper that she can't sleep because every time she closes her eyes, she sees them stabbing Scott. She said that she cries uncontrollably every time she thinks about Scott and is still haunted by his death. Stephen's stepmom, Helen, also spoke out, saying that she was heartbroken and that she never thought Stephen could do what he had, but that she couldn't abandon him. Stuart Jack, Debbie Buchan and Lee McKinnon appeared at the High Court in Edinburgh on the 8th of July 2008 when the charges of murder and attempted murder of Laura Milne, where Stuart pled guilty to murder and attempting to defeat the ends of justice, Debbie pled guilty to attempted murder and attempting to defeat the ends of justice, and Lee McKinnon pled guilty to attempted murder, attempting to defeat the ends of justice, and of fleeing to Glasgow after the murder. The trial was due to begin on the 8th of July. However, due to the guilty plea, the court was adjourned overnight in order for full details and evidence to be prepared to be presented to the court the following day. Following these developments, Laura's dad, Brian, said that the family were relieved and pleasantly surprised that the trio pleaded guilty as it meant that they would not have to endure a four-week trial of heartache hearing exactly what had been done to Laura. He said in an article in the Herald newspaper that they would just rely on the judge now to do his job. All of the shocking evidence was then presented to the court on the 9th of July. 
However, it wouldn't be until the 31st of July when the court reconvened and the sentences were finally handed down, before which Judge Lord Woolman had a few things to say in his statement. He firstly talked a wee bit about Laura and about her vulnerabilities, about the horrific unprovoked attack, about the attempt to defeat the ends of justice and the shocking video footage and how it was difficult to comprehend the evil that lay behind this attack. He stated that in determining sentencing, he had taken into account the information and evidence that had been submitted by each counsel, as well as the background reports, ages, and the difficult backgrounds of Stuart, Debbie, and Lee. However, he stated that he had also taken into account the ferocious and sustained attack on Laura, on someone who was supposed to be a friend, as well as the fact that they didn't seem to fully appreciate what they had done. Just to let you know, there's not much known about the three, but I'll tell you what I found out. 19-year-old Debbie Buchan already had one prior conviction for assault, and at the time of the attack and murder of Laura Milne, Debbie was already on bail for two further complaints of assault. Debbie told the court that she was embarrassed and ashamed of her actions. It was also noted that Debbie had said that she was sorry for her part in what had happened to Laura. 18-year-old Lee McKinnon also had a previous conviction of assault. She had apparently been an intelligent girl and had enrolled in a college course before drink and drugs took control. However, the judge said he would not be taking this into account when considering her sentence as he deemed this irrelevant. 22-year-old Stuart Jack lived a nomadic and chaotic lifestyle. He had no previous convictions but did drink alcohol to excess. Again, the judge said he would not take his excess alcohol consumption that evening into account when considering the sentence. Finally, the judge was ready to pass sentence. Debbie Buchan received a custodial sentence of nine years and four months. Judge Woolman also felt that the protection of the public was an issue, and so he also gave an extended sentence of three years, meaning that... When Debbie is released from prison after serving at least two-thirds of her custodial sentence, then she will be on licence and under supervision for a further three years. Lee McKinnon received a custodial sentence of nine years and also an extended sentence of three years. Stuart Jack received a life sentence, meaning he will be on licence for life with the punishment part of his sentence being 18 years, meaning he will have to serve at least 18 years before he will be eligible to apply for parole and release on licence. If he breaks the terms of his licence, he will be recalled back to prison to serve the remainder of his sentence. All sentences were backdated to when they were first taken into custody, the 20th of December 2007 for Debbie and Stuart, and the 21st of December 2007 for Lee. Stuart Jack... Debbie Buchan and Lee McKinnon showed no emotion as their sentences were passed or as they were taken away to start them. If you'd like to read the full statement by Judge Lord Woolman, you can find it under the sources for this case on our website. Following the sentencing, a statement was released by the family and taken from the Scotsman newspaper, it read, We are appalled that such a horrific crime has resulted in such a lenient sentence. They all played a part in Laura's death. And in our opinion, Debbie Buchan and Lee McKinnon should have had significantly higher sentences. We also want to put on record that Debbie Buchan's apology is of no consequence to us, and we hope their evil actions will always weigh heavily on their conscience. Yet again, the judicial system has let innocent victims down. It is no wonder we are experiencing increased levels of serious crime with the apparent lack of punishment. No sentence will ever bring Laura back to us or erase from our minds the memory of what they did to her. We will have to live with this for the rest of our lives. Debbie Buchan and Lee McKinnon could be out walking the streets again in just six years. Speaking of being released and walking the streets again, Irene Duncan served her 27-month sentence and was released where she proceeded to rack up numerous offences including a knife attack and assaulting the police. On the 6th of September 2018, she was witnessed leaving her property in Paisley, wielding two large kitchen knives and wandering around the area with them. The police were called and when they arrived, they saw Irene running behind a block of flats. When they followed, they found the knives and a screwdriver lying on the ground near where they had seen Irene running to. She was arrested, charged, and due to her breaking her bail conditions, was jailed for 22 months, to be monitored for nine months after she was released. 
it also transpired that she was pregnant and would be giving birth in prison. Karen Duncan was released from prison in 2015 and also moved back to Paisley. Less than two years later, on the 3rd of October 2017, when she was 26 years old, she was arrested after being verbally abusive and threatening towards a woman in the street in Paisley. The woman she was threatening was said to have been terrified. She pleaded guilty to the charge and due to her being on a three-year supervision order after leaving prison, she was to appear in court to be sentenced for breaching her bail conditions. However, she never turned up and a warrant for her arrest was issued and the hunt for Karen began. She was caught, however, and she appeared in court, but she was given a reprieve and instead of going back to prison, she was ordered to carry out 70 hours of unpaid work in six months. But it wouldn't be the last time she found herself in court. In February 2019, she was this time in court due to the fact that her Rottweiler and German Shepherd dog had bitten a nine-year-old girl on her left bum cheek. She did apologise profusely to the girl and her mother, and the girl made a full recovery, but she pleaded guilty to breaking the Dangerous Dog Act. She was fined £360, or just under $500. And then in August 2019, when she was 28 years old, she was arrested with her boyfriend after the pair carried out an attack on a couple who had been witnesses against their friends in court. Her boyfriend was seen to be carrying a knife, and Karen threw bricks through the windows of the house while the couple were inside. She was heard to be swearing and shouting that the couple were going to get it due to them getting her friend an eight-year prison sentence. The pair were arrested and Karen pled guilty to public disorder, but reported that she didn't remember much about what happened. On sentencing, again, she got a reprieve and instead was handed a community payback order She would also be closely supervised for two years and ordered to repay damages, which were £297 or $411. Debbie Buchan was released early from prison and on her release was being known as Debbie Robertson. She was to spend nine years and four months in prison, backdated to the 20th of December 2007. However, on the 25th of May 2016, eight years and five months after being sentenced, she appeared at Aberdeen Sheriff Court for assaulting her ex-partner. It was reported in court that 20 fresh human bite marks had been noted on her ex-partner's back and chest. However, her ex-partner also said that his chest had actually never been examined. Debbie's ex-partner stated that he had sat on Debbie to stop her moving after an argument had turned violent and that this was when she had bitten him, trying to get him off her. He then said he slapped her and knocked her head off the ground as he got off her. Debbie, who was now 27 years old, was cleared of this charge by a jury who determined that she had in fact been acting in self-defence during an argument between herself and her ex-partner. Lee McKinnon, who was given a nine-year prison sentence, was back in Aberdeen eight years and four months after being sentenced. And she had secured herself a job and changed her name to Cheryl Lee. While in prison, Lee who was now 26, had done some hairdressing training and had been cutting other prisoners' hair. And so to put these new skills to good use, she rented herself a chair at a barber shop at Aberdeen using her new name, Cheryl Lee. The barber shop was located about a mile away from where the horrific murder of Laura Milne had taken place. Not only were the clients she was cutting the hair off, completely oblivious of who the person cutting their hair was or her background, but also the owner of the barber shop where she was renting her chair had no idea either. When he found out, he was furious, not only because he had been deceived, but also because he had known Laura Milne. Laura's dad, Brian, was also angry, saying in the Press and Journal newspaper on the 7th of April 2016, I want to know why her sentence hasn't been finished. I'm angry that she got off so easily. And that just leaves Scott Burgess and Laura Milne's murderers. Stephen Price will be eligible to apply for parole after serving the punishment part of his life sentence of 15 years for the murder of Scott Burgess in 2022. He will be 34 years old. Stuart Jack will be eligible to apply for parole after serving the punishment part of his life sentence of 18 years for the murder of Laura Milne in 2025. He will be 40 years old. The Scott and the Milne families have had to try and find a way to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives after their loved ones, Scott Burgess and Laura Milne, were taken from them so brutally and pointlessly. 
it's clear that neither family were satisfied with the sentences that were handed down and feel let down by the justice system. So, has justice been served? And that's the end. If you've enjoyed this episode and know just the person who'd also like it, please share it with them. Don't keep it to yourself. Please also get in touch on social media if you have any questions, comments or suggestions and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All social media and contact details are on our website, scottishmurders.com, as well as all the source material and photos related to this episode. So that's it for this week. Come back next time for another episode of Scottish Murders. Join us there. Bye. Scottish Murders is a production of Clurin